Welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granik Allen. Today, we are going to have a U.S. panel discuss some of the issues and events happening south of the border. And there are plenty. There isn't a week which goes by where a Canadian news headline doesn't speak to the migrant crisis at the U.S. southern border. But why are migrants flooding the border and why now? And what policies has President Biden enacted to deal with the problem? And speaking of President Biden, he may be in for further upset, upset if the Virginia gubernatorial elections were any indication. Parents rose up, fed up with the radical and woke ideology being taught in their kids' schools, and demanded change and selected a Republican to lead the way, much to the shock of the Democrats. Is this the writing on the wall for Biden when midterm elections roll around next November? And will abortion feature prominently in those elections? After all, the U.S. Supreme Court has heard arguments for a case which may challenge Roe v. Wade, the nearly 50-year-old case which established abortion rights in America. The decision is expected in June 2022. And what about COVID? How does the U.S. compare to Canada in terms of COVID vaccine mandates? Are, are vaccine passports a big deal in the U.S. as they seem to be in every province in Canada? We hear about the freedom in Texas and Florida where mandates have essentially been banned. Are those states seeing a spike in death as a result? Well, lots to discuss on today's show, and joining me now is Pedro Gonzalez, political commentator and associate editor at Chronicles Magazine, and Adam Korzniewski, a combat veteran and former member of the Trump administration in the Treasury Department. Welcome, gentlemen. For Thank you so much for joining me today. Good to be here. Thank you for having us. Excellent. So let's start with probably one of the more recent things that has happened, which is this uh, gubernatorial election in Virginia. This sent shockwaves, I think, through the political establishment on both parties uh, in in America. Parents sort of revolted. They stood up and they revolted against this, this wokeism. Would this kind of action, do you think, be replicated everywhere? I'll, I'll let you have a shot at it, Pedro. I think it can and it should. And I have been interviewing parents across the country, even in places like Texas, where they've actually been waging these silent wars against stuff like critical race theory, but also gender ideology in public schools without much support from even their own party, Republicans. Now this is getting a lot more national attention. The help of activists like Christopher Rufo have really elevated this into a national issue. Whereas it technically it has always been, or at least for the longest time, it's been a populist issue, but it has never really received the kind of national attention it does now. The issue is, and I got criticized for this uh, early on for pointing it out, is that this is a real issue and it has the ability to win elections because it is so powerful. The thing about culture war issues is that they hit people where they live. Mm -hmm. It affects you and your kids. It's powerful. but. It's not clear that Republicans will do much more than tap into this anger to win elections and then basically govern as you would expect a Republican to govern, which is not all that well, or effectively compromise with the people and the things that you voted against. And I think you're already seeing signs of this in Virginia. Now, it's interesting you, you point that out because in Canada, we have a, a great sensitivity to um, some of these more social issues being used as wedge issues in election only to be abandoned by the elected once they they take yes. their office. So this this hits a sensitive point in, in Canadians' uh, hearts and minds for those who are engaged in this, and I, I am one of those Canadians. So we talk about, and Adam, I'll ask this question to you. We talk about, again, these parents um, active, getting together, getting active. We've seen this obviously for several years in various parts of America. Why has this struck a nerve now? Why now? So a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of this has uh, come out and people have been recording things. The most powerful tool in any political activist uh, arsenal is to record everything. And uh, people have gotten frustrated and they've used their phones really to uh, record the misdoings of these school boards. And People are starting to find out that school boards all over the country are filled with professional activists who probably hate children. That's really what it comes down to. And the parents are mad and they're standing up to do something. My goodness. Now, you say they hate children. We only have 20 seconds before a commercial break. Like, is that true? These activists hate children? Well, you know, you, with the gender ideology stuff, you have 
a group of people who are very academic, who are trying to uh, impose a lifestyle, uh, lifestyles uh, that are inappropriate for children, um, over sexualization of children, for example. Welcome back. We're discussing a whole host of issues to our neighbors south of the border in the United States. And joining me is Pedro Gonzalez and Adam Korzniewski. Adam, before commercial break, I you made a claim and I challenged you on it. Are these activists in the school boards, do they actually hate children as you claimed? Um, you wanted to, to unpack that for me. Please go ahead. Yeah, so these are academics. They want to steal the innocence of children. Um, they promote things that are hot button uh, left wing issues that you primarily see on Netflix that should be uh, closely supervised by parents. And, you know, these school schools have these children for six hours a day, plus maybe upwards of 10 hours a day away from the parents. And they're teaching them all sorts of horrific things. And parents are getting mad as a result of it. And they should be mad. So is the point that you're making is that they're activist teachers, essentially? Because not all, not all teachers are the same, obviously, but there's, there's a host of, of activist teachers, Adam? Yeah, so um, the teaching profession in the United States, especially in the public schools, are a radically left-wing uh, um, industry, but especially administration. Um, administration over the last 20 years has gone into a professionalization by uh, these uh, major universities, and they're producing people who use these platforms for uh, all sorts of postmodern critical race type of uh, theories that they're going to be pushing onto our, our youth. Yes, and uh, obviously this is something we have to be careful of in Canada because we have both those ideologies being taught rampantly in our schools. Um, I want to pivot for uh, pivot now to the border crisis, and many in Canada don't really have a handle on what is happening at your southern border. We know that there's an issue. We know that there are migrants flooding in. We don't know from where or and why, and, and maybe you don't either. Uh, but please give us some insight. Pedro, you can start this off. What's going on at your southern border, and what's the problem? So the Biden administration, even before it became an administration, sent signals to people south of the border that if you come here, we won't deport you. That signal was well received, and that's exactly what's happened. The most recent development has been the reimposition of the Trump era policy remain in Mexico, <clears throat> where people can apply for asylum without having to cross the border. They just have to wait in Mexico. Some conservatives see this as a victory. It's not. This is kind of like when the bouncer cinches off the rel uh, velvet rope outside of a club because the building has reached max capacity. That's really all this is. It's not even clear that it's actually going to do all that much to reduce illegal immigration. There is an exemption that if you claim to be gay and trans or something like that, if you have a, a queer gender identity, then you actually get fast tracked and you, you don't actually have to wait in Mexico for asylum how people are going to be held accountable to prove whether or not they're actually gay or trans or whatever, uh, I think we all know what's going to happen with that. It's going to be exploited. But ultimately, this is a debate over whether nations are allowed to be sovereign and de decide whether or not they have borders. And the long-term project here, and this is praised or uh, shamed, depending on whose mouth it comes out of, but the long-term project here is that if you want to change a polity if you want to change the political structure of a society, there are a few more effective and irreversible ways than actually changing the character of that country through things like immigration. Now, again, if you read the New York Times, uh, liberals will praise this, the demographic transformation of America, uh, but they'll also criticize it when people like me point it out. So uh, there are people in the United States that call this the kind of celebration parallax. Uh, it's good, uh, or I should say, this kind of demographic change isn't happening, and it's good that it is. That's kind of the view of the establishment in the United States. Now, some some would argue and push back and say, well, obviously, if these people are are coming and and gathering, I guess, through the route through Mexico, they're obviously escaping something. They they want to get to America because they see it as this this paradise, this place where they can live freely. Usually, people immigrate from their country because their country isn't doing well uh, politically. It might be communist or dictatorship. Is it wrong for them to want to escape to, to a better place? And, and what would be the appropriate path then in your mind? Setting aside the fact that we've incentivized this through opening up different kind of, let's just say, welfare programs or a culture of welfare and affirmative action to these people that really does create an incentive for them to come here and take advantage of this stuff. What is the, the limit on this? I mean, why not just empty out the, the country of Mexico 
and dump it into the United States? Why not do that with Honduras and Nicaragua? What is the, the limit here? And moreover, if these countries are actually, as you say, and in some cases this is true, they're, they're developing and there's, there's violence, things like that, and corruption, that's never actually going to be fixed. In fact, you're ensuring that these social problems in these countries will never be resolved because you're kind of affecting this perpetual, not just brain drain, but this drain of, of people. Uh, and actually, that is a huge aspect of this, right. this kind of brain drain. When you, when you specifically try to attract, that's not who's coming, by the way. But the point is, is that when you take people out of a country that has corruption and things like that, Welcome back. We're, ch we're discussing the challenging situation at the southern border with the migrant crisis in the United States. And joining me again is Pedro Gonzalez and Adam Korsniewski. Pedro, you brought up a, a fair point, and I, I can appreciate that because my father escaped communism and, and came to Canada as an immigrant. I'm a daughter of immigrants. Um, that, you know, there's this, this, there are two sides to this. Yes, you can escape your country and you can leave. And if it's a bad situation and you can start in, in somewhere where there's freedom. And of course, I, I appreciate that. However, what happens to that country? Who remains there to fight for freedom and fight those battles that, that need people to fight and stand strong for? And I, I think you were, you were going to make a comment on that. That's, that's exactly well put. And the issue is that we actually end up importing these problems into the United States. You look at places like California, where you have basically street warfare between Latino immigrants and Blacks who have lived there much longer than them. We, we just kind of brush these problems under the rug and pretend that we're all getting along in this multicultural paradise. That's not the case at all. Wow, very well put. Uh, do you want to comment on that, um, Adam? Especially, how would you rate uh, President Biden's response to, to the border crisis? He's been in office almost a year. Has he done what the Democrats want him to do? Well, he's done what the Democrats have wanted him to do, but his response has been abysmal. Um, you have to, the United States has to, first and foremost, stop incentivizing people from breaking the law across the border. You know, it is causing a massive drain on United States resources in both direct and indirect transfer payments uh, to immigrants, legal and illegal, um, as well as just the cost of uh, doing business in the United States. Um, it's destroying cities and, you know, it's an unsustainable flow of people into this country. And that's basically the Biden strategy is um, who cares. Now, I saw a headline and maybe you can unpack it for me, Adam, that the government, the federal government was going to give something like four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Maybe I'm off with this figure to every migrant crossing or is it a family or what? what's that all about? So the the and this makes me laugh a little bit. Um, so it's supposed to be for families that are separated at the border because of, quote unquote, Trump's uh, migration policies. But, you know, here's the thing is that the, the uh, Mexico border, um, the route through Mexico from Central America is a heavy human trafficking zone. The United States, as a matter of policy, separates kids from people they can't determine are their parents because of the just large scale human trafficking. Right. You're talking hundreds of thousands of people uh, in a year, maybe millions even. And you have to you have to do that. And th that's the thing is Mexican authorities do that on their side too, wherever they can. And this is just normal law enforcement practices that the Biden administration was looking to incentivize with a nearly half million dollar payment. Wow. Okay. Um, let's shift for a moment. Again, things that I think will become an issue in the in the midterms, which is just only about a year away. Roe v. Wade. It's at the Supreme Court. All of a sudden, in Canada, we see these er eruption of headlines that Roe v. Wade, your abortion precedenting uh, case, uh, might be challenged. And arguments were heard this week uh, based on a, a Mississippi law and their appeal to the Supreme Court. Pedro, can you pack what happened there for us? Right. Well, the. The issue is if the Supreme Court does do something that the liberal section of the United States feels threatens Roe v. Wade, then this is something like we're going to turn into a real life version of The Handmaid's Tale and that women's rights will be abolished and stuff like that. But I think actually a lot of the, the, the headlines, a lot of the media about this stuff is, is almost deliberately misleading, if, if not, uh, that's actually the point of it. I don't actually think Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. Uh, I think that maybe the, the law on the state level will be upheld, mm -hmm. but Roe will not. And ultimately, the position that I'm looking at this from is the position of the conservative uh, legal history. 
whether or not it has actually done what it's supposed to do, which is uphold these traditional values and institutions. In this example, uh, or in this in this case, uh, the the pro life movement, uh, this whether it has preserved the sanctity of life. Uh, my view is that it hasn't. That the conservative movement is basically just one defeat after another, and the reason that we hold our breath on things like this is precisely because we're hoping that for once we'll get a massive upset. Uh, I don't think that's what's going to happen. If you read the New York Times, like I said, uh, that is imminent. We're, we're we're about to go back to medieval times. I don't actually think that's the case. I think that the most likely scenario is that it's going to be upheld on the state level, but Roe will not be overturned. Hi, I'm Danielle Smith, host of the Danielle Smith Report, where I sit down for a weekly conversation with the top minds and leaders in the Canadian industry and energy sectors. Our mission is to unpack some of the biggest issues and policy decisions happening today so you can better understand what it means for you. Watch me weekly right here on the News Forum. Welcome back. We're talking about some potential issues or issues that are brewing south of the border. And one of them is, will Roe v. Wade be overturned with the recent hearing at the Supreme Court? And joining me again is Pedro Gonzalez and Adam Korzniewski. Adam, before commercial, and I'm sorry I had to cut you off there, we're talking about, uh, you know, with the decentralization of such a law, Roe v. Wade kind of governs all of America, but with each state potentially getting the right to set their own their own rules and regulations, because every state really is different. Would that be such a bad thing? And, and why is that such a triggering thing for, for the left-leaning folks in America? So uh, the nature of progressivism is ultra-centralization. But the nature of this particular question, Roe v. Wade, abortion, um, no matter how much it's being put da back down to the states, it will be a federal issue no matter what, just because of the nature of it. This is something, uh, the reason why we have such a uh, uh, commerce clause and all these things that allow the federal government to decide. And, you know, practically speaking, the United States has the most permissive abortion laws probably um, of the Western world. You know, maybe Canada might be a little bit Yes, more except permissive. for Canada. Except for Canada. Right. But, you know, like, uh, and that's the thing is like Roe v. Wade would not happen if it was decided in this current, uh, this current generation, just because of uh, the advances in medical sciences. And so, you know, really what we're going to be seeing is question is, does precedent overrule common sense? Um, and does precedent overrule states' rights? And, you know, traditionally, it does uh, overrule it, uh, regardless of the actual circumstances. But we could see it change or be uh, uh, watered down considerably. A weakening, a weakening of Roe v. Wade. Okay, well, I'm very interested in it because I find I've followed this issue uh, quite quite substantively over the years. And uh, yes, it's for me, this is very interesting. Okay, let's pivot to COVID in America. I and mean, we could go so many different ways with this. But in Canada, we really struggle with vaccine mandates, vaccine passports. Now we can't travel on planes or trains if you're not doubly vaxxed, potentially soon to be th uh, triple vaxxed. How... Are vaccine mandates being rolled out federally? And, and what are the various state responses, Pedro? Mixed. I mean, some states are, you could say, freer than others. That's for certain. Uh, you, you have a, a higher degree of freedom in places like Texas than you do in New York. But generally, I mean, if you look closely, this, this is definitely a national issue. And it. I think the, the main issue with, with the mandates is not necessarily, you know, how well, it's being rolled out, but just the fact that we have mandates and we're applying them to people like firefighters, police officers, nurses, doctors. I've spoken with police officers and firefighters in California who their own unions are against them. Their supervisors actively persecute them for asking for religious exemptions. I've spoken with nurses who worked through the, the surges during the last year or so when before the vaccines were available. And now they can't find steady work. They've basically been reduced to uh, working like contract, kind of like gig work right. uh, on the medical side of things. Same thing with doctors. I've, I've spoken with doctors who, again, worked all through the surge before uh, the surges, before vaccines were available. And then they ended up getting escorted off of medical campuses because they asked for a religious exemption. They didn't get it. They came to work and then they had security guards walk them out of the building. I think this is actually the main thing, the fact that 
you know, we're starting to see reports of like, and I've, I've heard these firsthand of places in California where you're, you're actually having delays in emergency medical service response times because all of the EMTs, all the medical technicians in a particular area, or most of them, uh, or just enough of them will, will not be go. vaccinated. So they're not, they're not actually allowed to respond to medical calls. My goodness. And so like a cop on, on a medical emergency will call for an ambulance and they won't come for two hours because there's just no one available. And all the EMTs that are complying with, you know, wearing masks and stuff like that, they're still basically just kept and segregated inside of different firehouses because they don't have the vaccine. Okay, Adam, this I want to, I want to get your, we only have 30 seconds left. Uh, what are your two cents on this? So um, the vaccine mandates on the state level, uh, mass mandates, et cetera, don't work here in the United States. California has about the same vaccination rate as Florida, despite Florida not having any sort of uh, mandatory uh, push on it. Um, and, you know, you're seeing like uh, states, the places like New York and California having new waves of COVID infections, uh, just like Texas and Florida are. And it seems like a lot of these policies just are not working. That's root grass tax. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to keep our eye on what's happening south of the border because it gives us an indication of what's going to happen north. Thank you both gentlemen so much for unpacking these issues for us today. Thank you for having us. Thank yep. you. Good to be here. Fascinating discussion because some of the issues that percolate south of the border will carry over to us here in Canada. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.